So let's now jump to, we, we pretty much talked about BTKIs in frontline therapy. Well, now we have the approval of venetoclax and obinutuzumab. So let's talk about the CLL14 data um, and how that fits in. So now we're talking about continued therapy. Patients have done well long-term on abrutinib monotherapy from the original studies. Now venetoclax, obinutuzumab approved frontline. Um, you know, how do you feel about that therapy? So I think um, we went from um, fixed duration chemoimmunotherapy that as we discussed, it may be used still in the community, although I think uh, you know, as we discussed recently, BTK inhibitor is, is well, a pretty established standard of care. But I think the, the importance of the CLL14 study is that's bringing back once again this, this uh, limited duration of therapy that some patients may prefer over long term therapy. I think, um, again, uh, this data still is not mature enough, and obviously, they have this uh, at least in the front line one year in the second line, around two years of therapy. And I think it's important to really emphasize that we still need to really see how those patients are gonna evolve over time, how those patients are gonna do after this continued therapy, and which risk categories, risk um, stratification of patient will uh, do better or worse depending on this time limit therapy. Because, well, as we, as, as Rick was discussing, we know that in the low risk category, ibrutinib in the long run, or BTK in general, they do fantastic if they really follow up of five, ten, ten, seven years. However, we don't really have the same data with time limited therapy. Obviously, we can or cannot really thinking about extrapolate the famous MRD negative. That is another concept that minimal residual disease negative is coming back to, to our clinics. And how we're going to really use in the standard practice is very unclear. I mean, FDA is still not really defined. We'll get, we'll get to MRD. Jan, what about, do you use venenoclax or venetuzumab up front in any of your patients? Or in those patients that, you know, we t talked about who have um, cardiac risk factors, need frontline therapy, does that come into your discussion if you go, oh, I want to avoid a BTK because they have AFib and they're on anticoagulation? And uh, exactly the point that was uh, made earlier. I think that's uh, exactly that population. If uh, there's a patient we fear is going to not do well, is somebody who had recent bleeding problems or who has a cardiac history and uh, we fear that uh, BTK inhibitors would uh, put that risk, uh, that patient at some risk, uh, then venetoclax is a good alternative. Uh, but if we use it in the front line, one of the key problems is if we do limited duration treatment, uh, patients will relapse from that and uh, we don't have a clear strategy what, what then to use next. The hope is those patients would probably respond to BTK inhibitors, but we have some limited data, data, that's data a, was that has, a, has it's very limited, but small. and there was probably a reason why in the first place we didn't use a BTK inhibitor. So uh, there are some problems with that. Uh, on the other hand, it's a highly effective regimen, and uh, the issue is uh, sometimes in high-risk patients, for example, that we don't know what is the best duration of treatment, the choice uh, in the relapse setting to go for two years, in the frontline setting in CLL14 to go for one year. Uh, that's coming from the drawing board and uh, in high risk patients, I would have some issues stopping treatment early because uh, it's hard to be expected. I want to add that in, I think you were mentioning the high risk patient, but, but I think we have to, to really go back to this uh, you know, feed patients or even patients who has low risk that, as we discussed, may can do, they can do um, good with anything that we have. But maybe, and in my opinion also, it may be a, an area that obviously we're gonna see how this data evolve, that these, these uh, limited duration uh, therapies who are very successful in eliminate cells from the bone marrow, may be a good opportunity for those patients in, in exchange of the classical chemoimmunotherapy that we have been discussing, right? Because, well, chemotherapy will eradicate the disease in terms of these, these uh, deep MRDs and may really prolong PFS. So I think I will advocate that maybe when, with more mature data, this population of patients may be the better really fit for this time limited duration because they may, may, we need to really wait for, for long-term follow-up, benefit the most for these uh, therapies, rather like a high-risk patient that we discussed, most likely they have a higher risk to relapse and sooner or later, they're gonna really require a second or third drug. So I do think just to follow up on that though, we, you know, we very quickly went from continuous therapy to two years of venetoclax to one year of venetoclax as we moved up with really no data guiding that decision. Right. And I think that you know, everyone discusses how patients would prefer to have fixed duration of therapy, and yes, 
Um, if you were to ask me, I would rather be on therapy for one year than two, but that's with the caveat that both therapies are equal. Mm -hmm. And we right now don't have those data. And so it's an important educational point that, you know, yes, these are fixed duration regimens, but we don't know if we're sacrificing anything. Ultimately, the hope is, is that when you do progress, you just go back onto the same therapy or a different therapy, and then you do well. And we've avoided having our patients treated for that period of time. I mean, that's the hope, yeah. and that's certainly the goal, but it's important to have an informed discussion with the patient. So would you guys like to see a study then, so knowing that many patients, particularly some of our younger ones, really want, you know, once uh, venetoclax and obinutuzumab have got approved in frontline, a lot of patients have that sense of, oh, I want this time-limited duration. Um, would you like to see a head-to-head -head trial of a brutinib or a calibrutinib or, you know, versus venetoclax obinutuzumab? Another arm, how long do we do 12 months? Do we do 24 months? Farouk? Um, sure. Uh, so I think we, ideally, we would love to see something like that, but we can have cross-trial comparisons uh, from multiple trials and take the arms from those trials. I understand that that's not the best way to do that, but if you look at those, the progression-free survival at two years is exactly the same for all three approaches in combination with the antibody and BC uh, BTK inhibitors and the same for BCL2 combination. So it hasn't really changed despite the um, MRD negativity being higher with venetoclax. So I think long term might be different, but short term it appears to be very similar across trial comparison. The other argument is that if my high risk patients is dropping off and relapsing, maybe 12 months is not enough for those guys. And that's one thing that's happened recently I, that I would call practice changing is in those patients, at least in the untreated setting, and we can talk about the relapse setting later on, um, but in the untreated setting, I'm reluctant to just stop at 12 months in my high-risk patient I was just subgroups. about to ask yes. you all that. Yeah, so I, I, I would argue that even if they're MRD negative, we sit down and feel more comfortable in stopping those group of patients. But uh, for the vast majority of my high-risk patients, I would not stop at 12 months. What do you feel for your high-risk? Let's just talk about that. Yeah, so moment. I think that the, you know, first off, I just want to add that the, you know, the question is probably going to not be answered by a head-to-head -head study just because that's a, a very long, huge study that's unlikely really to be um, worthwhile. I think we will be able to get the question answered by looking at a lot of phase two data. So if a patient, you know, progresses after a venetuzumab venetoclax, you know, what happens when they get retreated with venetoclax again? And those are data we will have one day. So I'm hoping that these are these important questions will be answered. Currently, what I think is one of the most important questions about venetoclax is whether or not there really is a maximal time before you end up with no further benefit. And the question becomes whether or not there really is anything to gain by continuing therapy beyond two years. And we will hopefully have data within the next six months regarding that question but I think right now in my patients, um, the data that is probably most guided is the mathematical data looking at, you know, doubling the time to MRD negativity might predict the time for maximal benefit. And so for a lot of the patients, I do do two years of therapy um, and then have the discussion depending upon how deep of a response that they've obtained. I think the you know, Captivate study will also be very helpful because it actually will also look at discontinuation of ibrutinib in addition to venetoclax and the reintroduction of ibrutinib plus minus venetoclax. And so it will really address a lot of the questions related to discontinuous therapy.